Hello, fellow true crime fanatics. My name is Hallie. And I'm Brittany. And thank you for jumping back on with us today for the Abyss Pod book club episode. We're going to be talking about American Predator by Maureen Callahan, and we are really excited to talk to you about it. If you don't already, go ahead and give us a follow on Instagram and Facebook, Twitter, at The Abyss Pod. And you can also give us a thumbs up and a five-star rating and a like or wherever you are. Go ahead and chuck it out there. Throw them around like it's nothing. We really appreciate it. We love your support and it helps us out a lot. If you're feeling generous this month, go ahead and check out our Patreon. You can find it on our website, and it's The Abyss Pod. You can throw in a few dollars every month, and it really helps us out. It helps us produce this episode for you and all of our content and just keeping it up to bring you the best of the best. Now let's dive into the American Predator. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to read the summary just in case any of you didn't read it or you just need a little refresher. It is, quote, Ted Bundy, John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer. The names of notorious serial killers are usually well known. They echo in the news and in public consciousness. But most people have never heard of Israel Keys, one of the most ambitious and terrifying serial killers in modern history. The FBI considered his behavior unprecedented. Described by a prosecutor as, quote, a force of pure evil, end quote, Keys was a predator who struck all over the United States. He buried kill kits cash, weapons, and body disposal tools in remote locations across the country. Over the course of 14 years, Keyes would fly to a city, rent a car, and drive thousands of miles in order to use these kits. He would break into a stranger's house, abduct his victims in broad daylight, and kill and dispose of them in mere hours. Then he would return home to Alaska, resuming his life as a quiet, reliable construction worker devoted to his only daughter. When journalist Maureen Callahan first heard about Israel Keyes in 2012, she was captivated by how a killer of his magnitude could go undetected by law enforcement for over a decade, and so began a project that consumed her for the next several years, uncovering the true story behind how the FBI ultimately caught Israel Keyes and trying to understand what it means for a killer like Keyes to exist. A killer who left a path of monstrous, randomly committed crimes in his wake, many of which remain unsolved to this day. American Predator is the ambitious culmination of years of interviews with key figures in law enforcement and in Key's life, and research uncovered from classified FBI files. Callahan takes us on a journey into the chilling, nightmarish mind of a relentless killer and to the limitations of traditional law enforcement, end quote. So clearly this book is a little crazy, and Maureen Callahan herself did an amazing job writing this book. She has a lot of experience, and it really shows. She lives in New York and is an award-winning investigative journalist and author. She obtained her bachelor's degree from the School of Visual Arts in New York City. And, well, I'm not sure if it's in New York City. It's in New York, for sure. And she worked for Sassy Magazine and MTV at the age of 17. So she started at a pretty young age. She knew what she wanted to do. She knew what she was interested in. And she's currently the critic at large for the New York Post. Now to get into the book... Maureen Callahan started off with the disappearance of Samantha Koenig. Samantha was a barista. If you have been to Alaska, you've probably seen these little coffee shacks that are all over the place and you don't go in, you just drive through and get your coffee and go. And they are just everywhere in Alaska. Great coffee. (laughs) So Samantha worked at one of these little coffee stands. She was working alone on the night of February 2nd, 2012, and she just vanished into thin air. They could not, they couldn't figure out where she was. They tried to look at the surveillance footage, and it was kind of a strange video to watch. There was a lot of time that Samantha was just sitting on the ground or laying on the ground. They could see somebody talking to her through the window, and then after a while, this man climbed through the window, and then he talked to her for a while, and then after a few minutes, they left, and they were really confused about this, so they thought that maybe Samantha just up and left. Maybe she had someone helping her, like a friend or a boyfriend, and she just wanted to get out. There was activity on her cell phone before and after she disappeared, so that was another indication that she was probably okay and just blowing off steam or just escaping, you know, small town kind of thing. Yeah, and they thought it was peculiar because she had asked her dad to drop off dinner at the stand, and then she was gone, so it's kind of weird to be like, hey, can you bring me dinner, and then just not be there when the dinner arrives, you know? 
yeah, there were lots of things that made it seem like it was just a normal night for her and that she was waiting to be picked up and just nothing out of the ordinary. But then at the same time, I think with young girls like that, they just kind of jump to them the runaway conclusion yeah Yeah. them like doing things on a whim and stuff so the first officers involved were officers Payne and Dahl and there's so many different officers throughout this whole book so it's hard to keep track of all of them but they are the ones that kind of kicked everything off and they pretty much like we said they started off the investigation pretty unalarmed at where she was they thought that she was kind of a high-risk teenager just running off and Either she'd be back in a few days or maybe she was just wanted to not be found. Yeah, and she had a boyfriend at the time and they thought maybe she was like getting away from some of the drama that they had, like the problems between them or maybe they ran off, you know, together. Or he helped her like kind of disappear for a little bit because she was angsty. There was a lot of stuff going around with him as well. We'll have the video, um, the surveillance tape that we talked about on the website so you can watch it and see what you think. I mean, obviously looking back, you know that it's a sinister situation, but just try to look at it from an unbiased perspective and yeah like fresh eyes yeah see if you would have made the same call yeah it's definitely strange because it's like they're talking for a minute and she doesn't really seem alarmed she doesn't go for the panic button um like maybe it could be acting or maybe she was scared but she wasn't showing it or maybe she knew the guy like it just it looks like a very weird setup normally you can tell when someone is very panicked in a video like a surveillance video you can tell even if there's no audio you can normally tell like when you know gas stations are getting robbed or things like that but this was very different to watch and the police thought if something did happen that it was probably at the hands of either her father or her boyfriend. So they went kind of hard into them initially thinking that they were super suspicious because they always go for the people that they know. So Mm -hmm. they kind of took that avenue initially, but things went super weird when a couple weeks later, after she disappeared, this weird ransom note appeared just on one of those little like cork boards that they have at trailheads and parks and stuff. And it asked for $30,000 for the return of Samantha and also had pictures of her and like her hair was done, her makeup was done in it. So it looked like she had maybe been taken care of well. And she was holding up like a newspaper with the day's date. That way they knew like this was taken then. That sparked a lot of new hope, but also a lot of confusion, I think. It wasn't even published on the internet or anywhere like crazy. They were just like, oh, here, we'll just stick it up like a missing dog poster. Yeah, like hoping someone would find it. Like how many people just like investigate (laughs) what's on those boards? Yeah. (laughs) And even weirder, the note said that they would release Samantha in six months, which is such a strange thing for a ransom. Yeah, it's like in six months like you could be asking for another ransom you could be you could have killed her in that point and tried to be on the run like there's just so many different things that could have happened in a six month time frame from them giving them giving the person the money which we know is israel keys and her being like returned back to the family and then it's also strange that he requested for like thirty thousand dollars in the reward when the or in the ransom when the reward itself was $70,000. So it's like, if he knew that they had $70,000, why wouldn't he request the full $70,000 reward as the ransom? Yeah. Lots of really strange details in that whole yeah. note. Samantha's ID and ATM card also went missing. Um, but it was kind of strange because her ID was in her car, which was not with her at the coffee shack thing. So it actually disappeared from her car and the I think it was the night she went missing Mm -hmm. um the boyfriend came out of the house and saw someone kind of like rummaging through the truck and then he just went back inside yeah and just left it like that's so strange to me but um so that was taken and that kind of thing and obviously the ransom note later and all that stuff started pushing investigators into the fact that this was probably not her just up and leaving yeah and then they were able to he he wasn't really smart about the atm card like when they gave him the ransom and taking it out right he was like trailed yeah they could literally track every single place that he went and it was literally a trail through like through alaska and then down into the lower 48 and through like i think two or three states at least and into texas they tracked him and they had surveillance footage, even though they couldn't see his face very well. They could kind of get the gist of, um, like, who he was and 
it was like in some things he was so calculated and like very meticulous about and then he just allowed himself to be tracked like through the whole country yeah i feel like we see that with a lot of serial killers we see them being like super careful in certain aspects and they seem like so smart and then something that anyone would consider a potential like reason to get caught and they completely ignore it and this wasn't like the early 90s or anything like that where surveillance wasn't the norm like this was 2012 so it was like normal for there to be cameras at atms it was normal for that kind of thing to be tracked for bank information to be online like that was just normal stuff yeah but they did track him into texas and eventually they pulled him over in the car and realized pretty quickly that he was their guy and took him in for the interrogation which set off a whole other weird (laughs) line of questioning and events yeah the whole story unraveled yeah they ended up finding out that samantha in the photo that israel keys had used for the ransom had actually been dead and she'd been dead for a while and you can actually see that picture i think we'll have it on our website because it's it's public like it's just out there which is really creepy because she is dead and she had been dead for a bit and he had kept her out in this shack in Alaska. And as we all know, Alaska can get very, very cold. So it was kind of like a freezer. So it preserved her body. And then when he decided that he wanted to do this ransom note, he basically positioned her in the way that he wanted her positioned. He put makeup on her. He like stitched her eyes open to like make it look like she was looking at them. And that's how he made it seem realistic. And he also took it with took the picture itself with a Polaroid and then took a picture of the Polaroid. So that way the bad quality would kind of cover up some of the little indicators that she wasn't alive or maybe it was makeup and things like that. Personally, I thought this book had great dialogue. Like I loved that it showed the discussions between Israel Keys and the interrogators and how it was it wasn't just like Israel Keys came out and said this. It was like his ums and buts and and his hesitations because it showed kind of where his mindset was and the way he was interacting with the interrogators, how he would go back and forth and all that kind of thing. Yeah, it was cool to get actual transcripts from the interrogations and the records and stuff. You really felt like you were in there with them and hearing the story first yeah, behind the little glass. Yeah. <laughs> So I loved that aspect of it too. I thought that was much more compelling than some books that are just like fact, 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 fact. And it really drew you into the investigation and showed what it was like for the investigators as he was saying this stuff and what it was like for him to be saying this stuff. Yeah. And they were even able to find out more about um, where he disposed of her body and how he did it. So he ended up um, cutting her body into pieces. And over the course of, I think it was three or four days he would drag like some of these pieces out to this lake where um people would ice fish and then he cut a hole in the ice and And he dragged them on a sleigh just like out in the open just like a sled of body parts and tied weights to them and dropped them in the hole and that was it and people were around like that's shocking that people were around him like fishing and (laughs) didn't pay any mind yeah he talked about the first day he went out there when he was trying to cut the hole he was really struggling because he didn't have the right equipment and he said there was a guy just like watching him struggle that had like all the equipment that he needed and neither of them said anything (laughs) and he just like watched him struggle to cut this hole in like the two foot thick ice so the good thing about alaskans they all want to mind their own business (laughs) honestly you can get away with a lot i guess but it took a lot to go and recover the body obviously it was it was a pretty deep body of water and then also just the frigid water it just takes a special kind of diver to do that and they had like a dive team with the fbi i think that went and found the body and it was hard for them to figure out who was gonna do this because they didn't want anyone who was like their first time finding a body or anything like that to have this like kids cut up body being their first experience with that so they got some really seasoned people to do it and even for them they said it was really tough to go down and they said like the first thing they saw was her foot and that's how they knew that they had like found where all of the body parts were and that was just I'm sure that was a hard thing to do and know that you have to like collect all these parts and bring them up but at the same time I think it's probably rewarding to be able to provide that closure yeah and talking about the closure Samantha's dad really wanted closure like he wanted to see his daughter's body but officer Payne didn't think it was a good idea most of the other officers didn't think it was a good idea and we're pretty sure that he didn't get to see his daughter's body which 
is for the best. I mean, clearly he had seen that picture of her, you know, and Mm -hmm. if he hadn't, then he definitely has now. And that's enough to, you know, traumatize a parent. So much less does he need to see like a dismembered body that was his daughter's, you know. And Officer Payne ended up getting PTSD from this case, and he stopped his career. During the case, we see a lot of officers all the time in multiple cases, Robert Hansen's case, all kinds of things where um, they just dedicate so much time to trying to catch this person. There's so many lives on the line, and they get so wrapped up in it that they forget about their personal lives or their um, relationships with other people. And so it happened the same with officer Payne, and he ended up losing his marriage because he dedicated so much time to trying to catch Israel keys. Yeah. And Israel keys was such a frustrating, I think more frustrating case than like many others because he just wouldn't, he wouldn't just come out and be like, okay, this is what I did. This is how you can find the bodies. This is how you can figure out what happened and then done, you know, like go to court and it's over he was like it was like a game to him so it would be like he would give them little breadcrumbs and then make them go find it and it might take them weeks or months to do that and then you know they'd come back and be like oh we we either didn't find it and then he would feel you know smug about his abilities or they would find something and he would give them you know one more breadcrumb israel seemed to really like having his crimes talked about I guess but he also was very much adamant about not having his name released to the press not having the details released to the press so he liked kind of the hubbub around what he had done but he didn't want it out to the general public at that point I guess yeah he was kind of back and forth he like wanted them to acknowledge him and kind of tease them about what he did and lead them on here or there and tell them different things. But then when it came to it, he was like, oh, no, 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 don't don't release my name. Or um, he wanted like an expedited execution and stuff like he just wanted it to be done. He didn't want to have to live with it. But then at the same time, he showed like no remorse. He was all over the place. He definitely flip flopped on like everything. But over the interrogation, I think the thing that stuck with me the most and like has stuck with me about this case in general is the amount of times that Israel Keys came across people that he intended to kill and then like little things would happen that he would change his mind and be like, oh, I'll find a new victim. When Israel was in Vermont looking for someone to kill, he first ran across this guy that was getting out of his car, but it was raining and the guy ran in his house too fast and Israel was like oh well I can't kill him so he went on and um would later find the couple that he killed that they never found the bodies and then there was another situation where he was on a trail looking for victims and he came across this woman but she had a really big dog and he thought like the dog would be too much trouble so he skipped her and moved on to the mother-daughter duo and then uh, the last time I can think of was um, he went to a lover's lane and intended to kill this couple that was there. But then a police officer came by and then he still kind of intended to kill the three of them. But then another cop showed up and he was like, oh, this is just too much. So he decided to leave and didn't kill anyone that night. So it was just all these instances where he was stalking people that never knew that they were in the sights of like a serial killer and probably don't know to this day. That was just like a normal day for them, you know, just running into your house or walking on a trail. It was just a normal day. And they had no idea that like feet away from them was the serial killer, like plotting their deaths. And then one little action, one little thing, you know, bringing your dog with you or running inside too quick. That was enough for him to be like, Oh, I got to pick somebody else. Yeah. It's crazy to think about that. And you wonder like him being a construction worker, how many times he looked inside someone's home or how many times he, you know, was standing in someone's backyard, putting up their fence. And who knows if he thought like, oh, I could kill them or I could come back how much he was analyzing their home so he could get in. Like, you have no idea. And it's just crazy to think about, you know, and it goes for anywhere you live, like all the people that you pass when you're driving on the street or the people that you're walking, all the like the people who live in New York, you don't know who you're passing on the streets and there's what like million over a million people who live there and it's such a small space like clearly you're passing by a lot of people and you have no idea who you're passing by when you get in a taxi and an uber you don't know who's driving like it's just crazy to think about ice cream trucks we've heard about people who kill people who like drive ice cream trucks who are ice cream truck drivers and that's someone that you consider to be safe you let your kids run up to them and get ice creams you know and 
they're murderers. You don't, or not all of them. I hate to say that. They're not all murderers, you know, but there are instances where we have seen that ice cream truck killers are real, you know? So yeah, it's just insane. Yeah. You really never know who you're around, who you're passing, who's watching you when you're at work or when you're just, you know, chilling outside in your yard or at the beach or anything like you don't know who's watching you, what they're thinking, what their intentions are. Prime example is the Antwerp diamond heist that we talked about in one of our episodes. It literally, the guy who constructed the whole diamond heist was working for the company and was a jewel thief before he even got hired. They didn't even know that, you know, and he was planning the whole time. He spent years planning this heist and it was one of the biggest heists for diamonds in history. So it's just crazy to think like you don't know who's around you ever. Like you don't really know. Yeah. And that just sticks with me with this case. That's like the creepiest thing about it to me. Yeah. And he obviously killed kill. He killed kill. (laughs) He buried kill kits. And one of them were in Texas that they found. And there's obviously more. They even in other countries, like not just the U.S. And there was a missing kid, Jimmy Tidwell, who went missing on February 15th when, you know, he was in Texas at that time. So it's just like he might have used a kill kit. There could still be kill kits out here. You don't know when you're walking at the park, even if there's, you know, a gun buried next to you. Like, you just don't even know. It's super creepy, too, that talking kind of about the Jimmy Tidwell situation is that um, there was a part during his interrogations where Israel Keyes said, quote, you don't have to buy real hair to get real hair, end quote. Like, think about that. He's saying you don't have to buy real hair to get real hair. That's like some Ed Gein, Jeffrey Dahmer types of things and you know there was speculation that it could be uh, one of the victims I think they might have found out it was one of the victims speculation maybe it was Jimmy Tidwell or stuff like that yeah it was in like the context of one of um of one of his other crimes where they saw in the surveillance footage that um the person the perpetrator had different hair than Israel but it matched one of the victims so he was saying like you know you don't have to buy a wig or whatever to get real hair which is just horrifying yeah absolutely horrifying yeah he liked to combine a bunch of different mo's which is why it was so hard to catch him like he didn't always go for the 15 year old brunette or the 60 year old man or whatever you know the person who looked like his mom like a lot of times people have certain victims that they target by age or gender or hair color or whatever and he didn't really do that he just kind of went for whoever he could he would kill in couples he would kill one person the only thing he would say is like i won't kill children but you know we can't be sure of that we don't really know and he considered ted bundy to be his hero and he would take little things from him and from mind hunter the book and from different fbi books and john wayne gacy and all of them and he would just take little parts of what they did and incorporate them in different crimes so that way it always seemed like it could have been a different serial killer he was really good at never having one specific area one specific type of victim or any of that like in the synopsis it says he would fly from alaska to like say he flew to Seattle then he would fly to Chicago and then he'd rent a car and drive through like Indiana and like a bunch of different states so it was very hard to like track where he was what he was doing and he would go you know he'd spend a few days in like Pennsylvania then New York then Connecticut then just all over the place so it's like in across terms of state borders yeah. across like international borders even into Mexico and through Canada and stuff so he had this tremendous scope of Like, he wasn't just in this small area. I know a lot of times um, you see in these investigations where they're, like, you know, put little pins on the board where the crimes are, and then they draw a circle around it, and they're like, okay, he has to live in this area. But for Israel Keys, it was just, like, all over the place. Wherever he wanted to go, that's where he was. It was interesting, too, how he committed so many different types of crimes. Like, usually you think serial killer. When you think of a serial killer, they pretty much just kill people, right? I mean, maybe there's assault. Maybe there's, you know... Um, what are some other things that serial killers do? I don't know, arson, something. animal abuse, <laughs> yeah, animal arson. Abuse, yeah. yeah. Um, stuff like that. Things that just like you would consider normal for serial killers to kind of all do in one. Israel Keys was not like that. He was like a serial killer and he was a bank robber and he made bombs. Like literally he was all over the place. He liked, what's that guy named Ted? 
Ted, uh, what's the guy, the bomber guy, Unabomber? Oh, Ted Kaczynski. Kaczynski, yeah. He admired him, and so he was, like, making bombs in his free time. And a lot of these things he would drop as sort of, like, side conversations in the interrogation. Like, it wasn't even like, oh, by the way, like, you should know this. It was just like, yeah, when I was making bombs, this was happening. And they'd be like, wait, what? You're making bombs? (laughs) Yeah, this one time I made a bomb, and that's right after. (laughs) Yada, yada, yada. It was also super creepy. Like we said, Israel wanted recognition for his crimes but then like didn't want recognition for his crimes so he would go on the internet and find articles about murders he had committed or um, bank robberies and stuff like that and then um, he would comment on these articles on forums on all kinds of different places on the internet just under his real name Israel careful on reddit (laughs) yeah yeah so that was really creepy because he would like put his you know quote-unquote thoughts in or like what his theories were or whatever but he knew obviously that he had done it and so as people that spend a lot of time on these forums and like looking for information and stuff, it's creepy that, that he's part of the conversation. Yeah. Like how many killers are commenting on their own forums and stuff on. Yeah. The and internet. I mean, they did that on, you know, don't fuck with cats. He was on the forums and talking with people who were trying to help solve the crime and they didn't even know. Be careful out there. <laughs> yeah. And then, it's super weird because, you know, a lot of criminals and murderers specifically like to go back and see their crime. They like to go back to the crime scene and watch the police clean it up or do the investigation or pretend to be a bystander or even help with the searches for a missing person. You know, that's another big one. But nowadays we have the Internet and web sleuths are a huge thing. And there's so many websites where people do it on Reddit and Facebook even. And so it's crazy to think that just as they would go to a crime scene, you got to be careful on sites like that as well, because you don't know who you're talking to and they could be the person responsible. Like you have no idea. Yeah. It's definitely so much easier with the internet these days. You don't have to be on site to really get a good view at the crime and stuff. So creepy. Also, you know how frustrated we get with like misconduct and court stuff, but it was so frustrating. for the- <laughs> Yeah. <marmal. laughs> Sorry. It was so frustrating um, reading about how the prosecutor Feldus just messed everything up all the time. Like anytime he was in the room, it was awful. And he was trying to take everything over, trying to take lead when the investigators were literally spending days to come up with their tactics and what they were going to say. And then Feldus would just come in like a cannonball and just blow everything out of the water and he couldn't really read people very well. So he kept just saying stupid things that gave Israel like the power that he really wanted and he would give away too much information. So it was so frustrating that this person that was supposed to be, you know, so concerned with conduct because if Israel had lived and they had to take this to court, there probably would have been so many issues with his conduct and how things were carried out and, So we just hate to see that. And even after he was reprimanded, he was still allowed in the investigation. He was still allowed to take it out of here. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So just yet again, another situation of just complete disregard for justice and ignorance. Yeah. Just someone arrogant and cocky and a little big for his britches. Israel Keys also, you know, came out about some of his childhood. He was really hesitant about it, though. And they also found out from, like, researching and things like that a little bit about him. But he had a really rough situation growing up. He had, like, nine siblings, and they were all home births, right? And he didn't have... Yeah, his parents were, like, very off-the-grid kind of people that didn't want any records of anything. So they were all... Nine kids were home births, no social security numbers, no birth certificates, no doctors, no dentists, no TV, no candy, nothing like that. Just, like, completely off-the-grid. Living like the cavemen. (laughs) And his parents were really... I guess vulnerable. I don't know. (laughs) They would, he described it as they would jump from cult to cult. So they would just kind of like find a group and like get really involved with it and then go into the next one. And they got into some pretty bad situations. They went from, um, I think they were initially Mormon and then the parents decided to drop that and they joined this white supremacist, white supremacist group called the Ark and became really involved in that. And um various other cults i think they were involved with the church of wells in texas which was just this like random guy that came into this small town and started buying up all this property and like 
having his followers move in and stuff. So they were very susceptible to all the cult things. The more we research stuff, the more we find out about these weird little cults. Like we just found out about like Jared Leto. Yeah. What <laughs> and is how that? he like pretty much has a cult. Yeah. Jared Leto. And <laughs> I don't know like, if it's been like confirmed it's a cult or speculate. Speculate? I mean, he calls it a cult, so. Oh, so it's a cult. So, so it's a cult. <laughs> a lot of times they're like, it's not a cult. It's just like a lifestyle. He was like, nope, I'm not going like, to lie. Yeah. It's a cult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Woo. Like R. Kelly and all these like just crazy stuff. Just insane. Yeah. Israel really tried to rebel against his parents like hyper religious views so he got into satanism as like a you know that's like pretty big rebellion against very devoutly religious parents and he got um i think he got like a pentagram tattoo on the back of his neck and he got a couple other tattoos and then he decided later that you can't really have satanism without christianity because like satan is part of christianity so he was like maybe this isn't for me and then he just kind of left religion altogether What I thought was super interesting is whenever you, you know, hear about serial killers or, um, you know, I always go back to Richard Kuklinski. I really liked his case. But when you hear about people like him, he knew he was different. He knew that what he enjoyed wasn't the same as other people, like killing animals or setting fires. Like those things weren't normal for other kids. But it's interesting because... Israel Keys actually thought he was normal. He thought everyone else thought like he thought and that it was totally okay. And that's probably in part due to the fact that his parents were so sheltering, like no TV, no like junk food, no nothing, like no internet, no plumbing, no anything. And so he probably kind of didn't have the socialization skills as everyone else would. But I just thought it was interesting that he literally thought like everyone likes to kill animals. Everyone likes to, you know, think about death or um assault people or rob banks like he just thought he was normal yeah and he really it was kind of learned to him that um that he needed to hide it like initially he didn't hide it at all like he would bring other kids out in the woods when he was torturing animals and um things like that and he was like why are they reacting weird like why is that kid throwing up when i you know shot this cat why are these people freaking out he genuinely didn't understand it until he realized like i guess i just can't bring people with me like (laughs) they just had like he thought they were just like weak or something but he had to learn over time that this stuff wasn't normal and they even talked to his parents and everything but nobody did anything to intervene israel wouldn't really talk about his time in the army much they know that he was stationed at fort hood which we all know there's a lot of shady things (laughs) yeah a lot of shady stuff happening out in fort hood Please don't come and kill us. <laughs> but they know that he passed the Ranger course, which is pretty intensive. And there was some evidence. A lot of his files were redacted, but there was some evidence. He even went through sniper training. So he was like specialized in that stuff. But he wouldn't talk much about his time in the army. But he did say, here's like a list of names of people who knew me back then. And you can go talk to them. Like he wouldn't give them anything, but he was like, you can talk to these people, which they did. Which is weird. Yeah. And some of the people said, like, he was a great guy and, like, they never had an issue with him. And other people said he was super creepy and, like, they didn't like him. So the people who said he was a great guy were probably kind of creepy. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably also part of the problem at four. <laughs> yeah. And he even, he talked about, I forgot about this, but he even talked about, like, that one guy he said he saw himself a lot in that guy and oh right yeah so he like told him all his plans to like kill people and rob banks and stuff and the guy was just like Meh, okay yeah <laughs> i'm sure they questioned him and he was probably like he was a great guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean he said that um like israel had talked to him about all that stuff but he like never raised the alarm never was like oh this is weird so i don't know <laughs> Once again, if someone details their plans to kill somebody, you probably should say something, maybe. (laughs) See something or hear something, make sure you say something. (laughs) In prison, it was really crazy. They, um, obviously he wanted to escape, as do probably most prisoners, I would assume. But he really wanted to do it because Ted Bundy was his idol and he just figured, like, you know, if he could do it, I could do it. 
And so they would always give him like floss and bags with lunch, disposable razors, pencils and all this stuff. And he would try to use them to escape. And it was like so frustrating in the book for the detective or I guess the um, investigators and stuff and the police because they would say like, do not give him anything. We keep seeing him hiding them away, trying to use them to escape. Do not give him anything. And he would come back the next day. He'd have a razor with him and he was, are you guys not listening to me? And he was (laughs) like, the only thing he could do was put a sign on the door that said like, he is not allowed to have any of these items. And still like the police just wouldn't listen to them. And like, if we have these protocols in place for a reason, then you should be following them. Yeah. It's like the warden is supposed to control the guards. And if you can't even do that, then why are you even there? Like, why are you managing these people? If you can't even have them stop giving these items to a prisoner like that's the most basic thing so if you really have that little control then you shouldn't be you should be removed from that position exactly and they even gave him a electric razor at one point like an electric razor and they were like only let him use this under direct supervision they couldn't even follow that you can't watch him while he shaves and then take it back you know like it's just yeah. absurd that that's you know if you can't watch him don't give it to him like he doesn't get a shave today it's not gonna be the end of the world yeah exactly it was like completely inept and um we talk about this a little bit later but it's one of those things where it's like basically one of two situations either they're just completely incompetent they have no like regard for the rules they just don't care at all for like any of the inmates they don't care about the rules they don't care about anything they don't care about their manager or they were purposefully like giving him this stuff because they didn't like him and they wanted you know sort of the problem to just take care of itself so um or maybe they were being like paid off somehow or uh, there's just so much corruption especially i know alaska is not really known for the prisons to be super like above the book and like going by the rules and stuff so i don't know what was happening there but it was just insane that they were like don't give him this stuff and then literally the next day he would have everything and they're like wow You have to be able to, like, control the people in your prison. Exactly. And he wanted, like, an expedited execution, like we talked about before. And so giving him razors and not, you know, supervising him, that's not a safe situation. Definitely when he wanted to be dead. Yeah. Like, that should be suicide watch all the time. Exactly. He even would kind of, like, take pencils and whittle them down into keys that he used to, like, get out of the shackle. <laughs> so there was one time he was in court, and literally in the middle of these court proceedings, he just busted out of his shackles and ran down the line, and they had to, like, tackle him to the ground. And he had used these, like, tools that he'd been given just to break right out of them, which is crazy so then which whose fault is that yeah the police who weren't observing him appropriately and giving him these tools without su- proper supervision knowing that he does this yeah exactly so that pretty much made a mockery of them in the courtroom as it should yeah and after that <laughs> they made him wear like double shackles all the time so it ended up like if you read the book or if you even know the israel keys case his death is like a really big part of it it leaves a lot of lingering questions but he ended up killing himself in prison with a razor blade and a noose he also wrote with his own blood we are one on the wall with 12 skulls and he also wrote the word valise which is like a final clue they don't really know what it means necessarily they believe that the 12 skulls are equivalent to the 11 people he murdered or at least confessed to murdering and then the 12 skulls himself And then we are one symbolizing like they are all together or something like that. But a lot of people, including both Brittany and I, believe that he killed a lot more people than just 11 people. There's no way that he went through all of this trouble to bury kill kits and travel all over the place and, you know, do all of this to only kill that many people in his years that he was actively doing it, you know? Yeah, I definitely think that there are more victims out there. He was just so, like, obsessed with it. I think that it would be not surprising that there were a lot more victims. Yeah, and if anything, we usually see um, serial killers pick up the pace with it. So they might start by killing once a year, and then it's twice a year, and then it's 
once a month and then it's twice a month. And the next thing you know, it's like with um, who we talked about Clifford Olson, where he's killing like six kids in one month, you know? So it's like they get on a high almost where it's just like they want more and more and more and more crime. And so it's kind of hard to believe that he only killed 11. Definitely when people were reporting, seeing him like all over the world, like there could be missing people's cases in other countries that aren't even tied to him right now. Yeah. And we know that he was in Egypt. He was in Saudi Arabia. I think he was in France at one point. So those are just the places we know. And we know how he just, you know, he'd fly somewhere and drive somewhere else and then drive around. So he could have been anywhere in the world, honestly. Yeah. And the night that he killed himself, the night shift officer wasn't, you know, aware of anything. And they say that there could have been corrupt officers that specifically moved him out of the suicide watch cell and then gave him a razor this obviously isn't surprising like we talked about the alaska justice system is kind of corrupt in the prisons and such and so we know that there's been corrupt reports in the past and it wouldn't really be surprising like they illegally record attorney client conversations sometimes and things like that so it's not really shocking by any means and to further the suspicion with the prison is that They've requested to release all of the surveillance and the autopsy report, but the prison refuses. They, like, won't release anything in regards to his suicide that they have on file. Yeah, pretty much all we know is he went to the law library at 7 p.m. that night. That was his third night in a row, third night in a row there. He was really hitting those books. Yeah, and then he was escorted back to his cell. The corrections officer said that they performed the nightly duty that night and did their checks and nothing seemed to miss. And the last check for the night shift was at 5.30 a.m. And there was, like, nothing strange in any of the cells or anything. They saw, um, I'm pretty sure they saw, like, keys under the blankets, just, like, normal Asleep, sleep. yeah. But 27 minutes later at 5.57, the guard went through and saw blood all over there it was like pulled on the floor and just lots of blood in there and keys was still balled up on the bed so he took the sheet off and realized that he was definitely dead he was in rigor already and he was blue just um quite obvious that he had been dead at least three or four three to four hours there were also containers i think two um cups and a milk carton which It's probably another thing he shouldn't have had. Exactly. (laughs) Um, And they were full of his blood, which is probably what he used to draw all over the place. Yeah. And that's just one of those things that they think was part of the corruption, too, is it's like, how was there cups of blood and a milk carton of blood and the drawings on the wall that he made and a pool of blood on the floor and the night guard didn't notice anything? Yeah. You know, that's just kind of suspicious. Like, what kind of check are you doing that you miss all of that? (laughs) Yeah. Like, that's a lot of red in a white room (laughs) or a gray room, you know, like a lot. Yeah. He left a really long um, suicide note as well that kind of didn't didn't like confess to anything or give like concrete answers to any of the questions. But he talked about um, linking his victims to like butterflies and moths. And there again, like he really was obsessed with other serial killers. So he was kind of paying homage to the Silence of the Lambs with that. And he wrote like weird convoluted stuff like he wrote about the american dream um like poetry and yeah like trying to get very philosophical in a way with it but it's hard to know what he really meant and we'll have that all up on our website there's like a like a picture of the letter he wrote so we'll have that up so you can kind of see if you can read it his handwriting is kind of bad but if you're wanting to check it out There's a lot of files with this case that are still unreleased. Obviously, there's a lot of unsolved cases that are probably associated with Israel Keys. Um, And to that end, they think that his suicide was like his final act of sadism and just this push for control. Like, I am taking all this information with me to the grave and you will never know. And that was like his last power move. So it's pretty sad that there's so many unsolved cases, so many families that go without closure because of the information he took with him and because of the, you know, corruption and the um, investigation not being as like thorough and well done as it could have been. So it's sad to think like what could have happened if everyone had just done their job appropriately. 
yeah overall so we know with nonfiction books if you keep up with our book club episodes i always do audiobook and Brittany likes to read the nonfiction books and then it's the opposite for fiction books i like to read them and Brittany likes to do audio and so with this one i really liked the audiobook i thought that the speaker did a really good job but there was a lot of like rough criticism on her about the way she wasn't able to change her voice enough to be different characters but i thought she did a really good job and overall i thought the book was like really well written yeah i thoroughly enjoyed this book i think it was especially for nonfiction. i think it was very very well written very compelling very engaging intriguing yeah like yes. it kept you hooked yes definitely so going on to our book for next month we know you're all eager well we hope you're eager um we're gonna be giving our girl Megan Miranda a second go another shot I know we went pretty hard on her book all the missing girls so this one we think is gonna be a lot better we usually read them beforehand and if we don't really like them or we don't think that they're good for the show then we just kind of cut them and then replace them but we haven't read this one yet so we're right there with you guys and we're pretty excited about it it's called The Last House Guest, and it's by Megan Miranda. It will come out on April 2nd, 2021. And we're going to tell you the summary. That way you can get a little feel for it and see if it's something that you're interested in. Quote, Little Port, Maine has always felt like two separate towns, an ideal vacation enclave for the wealthy whose summer homes line the coastline and a simple harbor community for the year-round residents who, whose livelihoods rely on service to the visitors. Typically, fierce friendships never develop between a local and a summer girl, but that's just what happens with visitor Sadie Lohman and Littleport resident Avery Greer. Each summer, for almost a decade, the girls are inseparable until Sadie is found dead. While the police ruled the death a suicide, Avery can't help but feel there are those in the community, including a local detective and Sadie's brother, Parker, who blame her. Someone knows more than they're saying, and Avery is intent on clearing her name before the facts get twisted against her. Another thrilling novel from the best-selling author of All the Missing Girls and The Perfect Stranger, Megan Miranda's The Last House Guest, is a smart, twisty read with a strong female protagonist determined to make her own way in the world, end quote. This book, I feel like, is going to be good because you can see it everywhere. Like, when you go to the bookstore, it's, like, up on the podiums. It's, like, literally everywhere right in front of you. Kind of like, uh, what's that other book that's, oh, All the Light We See or something oh, like yeah. that. That one's all over the place. This is the same way. So I feel like it's going to be a good book. It definitely, from what I've picked up at the get-go, isn't as back and forth as All the Missing Girls. I might be wrong. Like it may start doing that later, but right now it's not. So I think it's going to be a good read and I'm excited to get to chat with you guys about it. Yeah. So we will talk to you about that book next month. And thank you for diving into the abyss with us once again. We'll see you later. Catch you next time.